Amen. And if you have a heart for God to move in your life right now, he's moving. If you have a heart for God to show up in your life. He's showing up. Our greatest days. are Starting to arrive. Expect divine appointments and divine assignments. Turn your Bibles with me. To Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four. And I want to start reading at verse number six. Even as David also describeth the blessedness, a blessedness. Of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are recovered. Blesses the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. We've been talking in here about the blessing of God. We found that one of the first things that God gave Adam and Eve was the blessing. Right? It's a tangible force. It's an empowerment to prosper. An enablement to win. It's God backing you in whatever you do. I was uh, watching a video, I think it was this morning it came up. I was a little kid, he was probably, I don't know, four years old, five years old or something like that. And he's got a full-size basketball looking at a 10-foot high rim. And he's going to try to make this basket. And he, he takes it and he throws it up as high as he can. It makes it about three feet in the air. And he doesn't see it, but his dad catches it and throws it up onto the basket. And the boy looks and goes, goes and he goes, yeah, and he starts cheering and running around, you know, celebrating. I mean, oh, the boy didn't make the basket. The father made the basket. And the blessing, I believe, can be described as partly as that. You'll try to do something and God will score it for you. You recognize there's a God, a father backing in your life. And there's a supernatural covenant. How can I say partnership? that the blessing will enable you to win or prosper in whatever you put your hand to. But you've got to determine it's on you and try to do something. Now, in the Old Testament days, our, our spiritual fathers understood this blessing. Remember, Abraham was blessed, became very, very rich in silver and cattle and gold and sheep and everything else. No matter what he did, it seemed to come out on top. Isaac became blessed. He prospered even at the time of the famine. Isaac prospered because he followed God and did what he said to do. And then Jacob, wanting the, the, the blessing, was willing to cheat, steal, and lie for it. To scam his own father out of the blessing. Because he knew it was a tangible force. And we talked about this before. I've always wondered, why did God let him get away with that? Why did God let Jacob get away with scamming his own dad? For the blessing. And I believe what God has told me. And I, I believe the word would back up. Those that hunger and thirst for the things of God. Get it. And God saw a hunger. And appreciation for the supernatural. Connection with the father. That Esau didn't have. And even though he cheated for it. He answered the hunger. Amen. He answered the desire. And the same thing is true for us today. Now don't be trying to cheat, steal and lie. But you've got to desire the blessing. You've got to believe there's a supernatural empowerment available on your life because you are now a Christian that will enable you to win in every situation. So it says here, Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute sin, who the Lord has imputed righteousness instead. And we are the generation, the end time church bridal generation, the glorious bride generation, that is getting a hold of the concept that you're not some sinner saved by grace. All your righteousness is not filthy rags. You were filthy rags, but now you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you recognize because you're righteous, you have divine rights to the promises of the kingdom of heaven. You have rights to all of the power and authority of Jesus himself. Amen. So the Bible lets us know we will reign through righteousness. Through understanding who we are and what God has made us, who he's made us, what he's given to us, it enables us to win over every situation and attack in life. 
Amen. And the more you understand who you are, the more you can step into receiving of those promises. Because the enemy's number one attack against the, against the saints, the number one attack he'll bring against you to keep you from receiving what God has for you is condemnation. He's always going to say you haven't done good enough. You've not been spiritual enough. Remember when you fell asleep in prayer? Remember when you were to, to church late? That about hit all of us, wouldn't it? Amen. Remember, remember, remember all your missteps. And if he can get us questioning our, our deservedness, our rights to receive, it, it, it neutralizes our faith and keeps us from being able to access it. But when you understand you've been made a child of God, a joiner with Christ, amen, son of adoption, oh, as deserving as Jesus, through the blood he shed, right? Then you can say, condemnation, you don't belong to me. It's not by works of righteousness I receive. It's by the impartation through the blood, through the cross. And I receive my inheritance now. Do you follow me? Well, listen, God is not just giving us. Listen to what I'm about to say. God's not just giving us a revelation that we're made righteous. He's now releasing to his church a revelation that through that righteousness, they are receivers of the divine supernatural blessing of God. A blessing that enables you to win. Now, I'm going to get into in a few minutes about battling for your blessing. How many know once you found it about you had a right to divine healing, there were some battles you had to fight to get a hold of it? Still fighting some, right? And when you found out God wanted you to prosper, there were some battles you had to fight. And really, those could all fall into subcategories of the blessing. But I'm talking about a blessing you confess on your life every day. That no matter what I do, God's there ahead of me, has made the crooked way straight, and I receive of my benefits. Amen? And I've been doing this daily ever since going to Oklahoma here a couple months ago. I just really been focused on confessing the blessing all my life and believing for supernatural appointments, divine appointments, divine connections, divine uh, uh, provision, everything lining up that I need. And I'm watching this happen. Uh, I mentioned it uh, Thursday night. I had bought. I had an old Tahoe, 05 Tahoe, I'd bought. And I tried to sell it to the junkyard. I said, just give me what you think it's worth. I was expecting $100. And he kept getting delayed. He said, my guy's on another assignment. He can't get to it. This went on for about a week and a half or two weeks. And finally after that, I said, God, something's going on here. This isn't normal. He's picked up cars from my house before. He's usually right there. And I felt the Lord say, don't sell it right now. So I held it, and I told Pat, I'm not supposed to sell it right now. I believe I'm to buy another Tahoe and take parts from mine and put on that. And so we did. For Church of Light, we bought another Tahoe, and uh, it turned out most of the stuff bad on that one. In fact, everything other than the rust damage that was bad on it, I had on mine. So I moved over, wheels and tires, hitch assembly, a transmission cooler, brake lines, carpeting, uh, interior pieces, just a whole, whole gambit of stuff we took off my truck. And then I took everything off the old Tahoe I thought I might need for a spare part in the future. Alternator, power steering, pump, uh, mirrors, other things. And I thought, now i got to get somebody to haul off this old Tahoe. And I thought, well, there's the seats in it are pretty good. I'll see if I can get somebody to buy the seats. And I'll put on the bottom and other parts. So last Wednesday morning, I put, I pulled, I had, I gutted that Tahoe. Seats were already out of it. I took a picture, put it on Craigslist and on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, seats for sale, put 50 bucks on it. And Patty was going almost mockingly like, you think those will sell? You think somebody will buy those things? I had 50 messages in the first hour. Can you hold them? Can you hold them? I said, no, I got to get rid of this. I don't, can't hold them until tonight. I, had somebody, I couldn't even answer all the calls quick enough. And finally, some young man uh, messaged, can you hold it till seven tonight? I said, no. 
I've got a lot of people wanting me to hold them. First come, first serve. He said, I'll be right there. He came and bought the seats, a mirror, the engine, and later texted me. He says, what do we take for the rest of the truck? I said, another $100. Just threw it out there. He said, okay. He gave me $220 for the thing. I was thought I was going to pay somebody to carry off. <laughs> and I was sitting there watching all this fall into place, just me not doing anything. And I'm going, this is the blessing. They paid me to haul off my junk. Praise <laughs> God. And then at the 127 yard sale, I'm just watching God move. We went to one sale, and the lady says, everything out there is, you fill up a bag, it's $2 for the whole bag. I'm grabbing stuff, and it's cables, exactly cables I was needing for different things. Pieces, I just, there it is. And nobody else might want it, but it's perfect for me. Went to another one, and the lady said, everything in that box is, is 10 cents. Well, I'm throwing things, I'm not even looking, I'm just throwing, I threw, th 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 I had $1. thirty in, in my hand. I threw 13 things in the bag. And I get back, and in the bag, it's not in the box, but it's a brand new chainsaw sharpener. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was some kind of can opener or something. And I looked up the part number on the, on the internet, and it's a chainsaw sharpener. And they sell for about 50 bucks a piece. But it doesn't have any bits. I'm talking about the blessing, you follow me? And I know this is not anything big, it's not major, but it's just fun watching God move and orchestrate things. So I said, Patty, the bits aren't here. i got to go back there and look for the bits in that box. So the next morning I got it, and, and I looked online, the bit for that is $24. It's a diamond honing bit. So that was half the price. i got to go back and look for that bit, because I need a chainsaw sharpener. And uh, I go back, they're not, they're not there. And this is a specialty uh, little bit. It's not like everybody has those laying around in their toolbox. So I said, well, I guess, you know, I'll just put an egg beater or something out, make something out of it, you know. And uh, later that day, after I'd gone back, we go to another one of these yard sales, and they got this big trailer full of bags of pieces. And I pick up this bag, and there are three of those bits brand new in the package, <laughs> as well as about, 15 more of them that are the emery style, not diamond. And other stuff, other parts in there, tool pieces. And I said, how much are these bags? Is there a dollar? So, now, what were the chance of me finding a bag with three brand new bits of the piece I just bought? It was, And I'm just celebrating the blessing everywhere I went. And divine appointments, div it, it would take me all morning to describe this stuff. It seemed like we are just falling into place. And, uh, had I think it was the funnest time I've ever had at the yard sales, just because of the blessing. And but you have to confess it. You have to use your faith for it. In fact, we've described what it takes to live by faith, what it takes to use your faith in five steps. Do you remember the five steps? I brought the chalkboard out here to write them down because I want to talk about battling for the blessing. Five steps of living by faith. What's number one? I heard somebody say it very quietly because they were afraid they might miss it. Revelation. If you want to receive anything supernatural from God, you've first got to get a revelation that's available to you. That it exists and you can have it. I mean, I was a Christian for three years before somebody told me I had a right to divine healing. I've been going to church most of the time, and nobody people taught me God putting a sickness on you to teach you a lesson. But nobody ever taught me that God wanted me healed. Do you follow me? And when I got a revelation, now I know, hey, something's there I can have. But until you get the revelation and it becomes rhema to you, you know, you you have no ability to access what God has promised. Step number two. Meditation. Meditation. Once you find out God's made you a promise that you got a revelation to, you really don't have a platform for faith yet. 
You just know it's available. You have a mental ascension to it. Step number two is meditation. To chew on and mold over and over again what God said you could have until it moves from your head down into your heart and you know that you know it belongs to you. Do you follow me? So when I found out, hang on with just one second. Let's see if this airs on. It is. It's cool. Go pop to me. Here I am, I'm back. Once we have the revelation and then we meditate on it, it moves from your head to your heart and you have now a foundation for faith to be released. Right? Now you don't really know it belongs to you. Now it becomes ridiculous regarding healing. It becomes ridiculous to you that you would be sick. Amen. So then once you have this faith platform has been developed, what's step number three? We could call it activation or application. You got to do something to release your faith, right? And we found an application. If you really want to receive it, it's not enough just to believe it. You got to act on it, right? We found there's three steps to that, right? You remember the three steps? You speak it. You act on it. What's the third one? You guys are getting this down, aren't you? You know what helps you remember these? Is doing them. I mean, I've had people try to describe directions to me, like, you know, go down there to the to the corner and turn there to that building and turn it. And usually about three three turns, I'm lost. I'll make the three turns go ask somebody else how to get further. And, uh, but if I drive it, I've got it. I mean, I've been to Ghana now six times, I think. I still don't know my way around. I, because I don't ever drive. I'm always talking, looking. I'm not paying attention. To what, and and it, there's not street signs everywhere. And so I get all turned around. But if I drive it once, I got it for the most part. You did it. You acted on it. You, you you were involved in it versus just hearing about it. When you really start to learn to apply yourself to living by faith, I wouldn't even have to tell you these. You, you could make them up yourself because you know. This is not some big revelation. This is what takes place in every faith development and application. This is the, these are the steps you go through. Revelation, meditation, activation. So the first thing you do to release your faith, if it's healing, you say, by your stripes, I was healed. Sickness and disease, you get off of my body. I'm the healed. And you confess it. Then what do you do? You act on it. You know, I understand there's times you may not be able to walk or move or, you know, keep things down. But what you can do, you do. You get out of bed if you can. You get in the shower if you can. It may not be wise if you go to work, depending on what's going on with you. But if you can, you go to work. You fight through pain. You command, you've commanded pain to go. You fight through it. And you put action to your faith. Because faith without works is dead being alone. So you step out on what you've spoken. Because if you don't step out on what you've spoken, you don't really don't believe it belongs to you. Amen. And then the third step is standing. You keep speaking, you keep acting until it manifests. Because as soon as you say it didn't work, or I don't have it, or you quit applying your faith to it, it'll become neutralized. So you stand. And Kenneth Hagin said this. He said, if you're willing to stand forever, it won't take very long. The devil knows when you're close to wavering and he'll keep the pressure on hoping he can get you to quit. You just keep pressing, you keep pressing, you keep pressing until you have what you're believing for. Amen? And as I recommend to people, when you're using faith, learn to start small. Don't wait till you're, you know, you got stage four or something before you start using your, your faith. Start with a headache. Start with whatever. You know, 
I've got things in my physical body that I'm using my faith on that I could go have fixed. This tooth is one of them, right? This new tooth position I've developed. Well, I can go have that fixed. And I may do it. But I'd rather use my faith fighting for a tooth and make that the front than something that's very serious. You follow me? So learn to fight where you're at for the small things. Even if you can have, you know, something easily taken care of. Become a fighter by faith. You stand. Step number four. Now it gets fun. Manifestation. That's not talking about devils manifest, manifest, manifesting. That's talking about you were believing for healing from a headache. It's gone. You follow me? Your bunions disappeared. Whatever it is you're believing for, it's fixed. Maybe just a piece of it's fixed initially. Well, the Bible says first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. You take that victory you have. Maybe your pain was cut in half. And you say, yes, it's working. Even if it doubles in pain, you still say, yes, it's working. Do you follow me? Hold the lesson on that we're not going to get into today. You say, yes, it's working. I refuse to quit. But you have manifestation. Amen. Why? Because you've accessed through application a supernatural force of whatever you're believing for that now it's coming to pass in your life. Now, step number five is a little more complex. Restoration. Which is what we're after. And what I believe the glory will produce. But I'm not waiting on the glory for it. Restoration is where you discovered every promise in the Bible. Where there's a challenge in your life. And you have them all working actively in your life. You're, help, you're healed. You're prosperous. Your marriage is blessed. Your children are blessed. Everything you put your hand to is working. You're, you're, you're living in a state of restoration. Which is really a heavenly condition. And the glory itself is going to produce restoration. But you don't have to wait. Anyone you have to wait you know, to get to heaven, the final after death heaven, to be healed, you'll just wait for restoration either. Now, we've taught on these quite a bit in the past, right? That's why you were doing so well. I give yourself an A-plus today. Amen? Whether you answered or not, somebody answered for you today and you're a corporate body, right? How's that for helping you out, right? Cheat sheet day. Copy other people's paper day. Then. We apply these same five steps to every promise in the Bible. But guess what? The blessing, the tangible force on your life, that, that covenant partnership with God that enables you to win requires faith as well. You've got to believe it's yours. So what do we do? We've been talking about getting a revelation of the blessing that you really realize. This is what I'm trying to get across in these teachings. You really realize there's a partnership with God you can live in. Daily, you can experience daily. Now, I've been on trips sometimes where Patty couldn't go or, or refused to go. And, uh, uh, for example, some of the overseas stuff, I ain't going to. I, don't, mm -mm. I like air conditioning. And whenever I'm gone from her, there's not a day goes by I don't think about being with her. And I will count down the days till I get to be back with my wife. Because she completes me. <laughs> I will be counting. This is serious. I will count the days down until I get to be back home with my wife. I'm excited about going. But there's something that's not with me while I'm gone that I can't wait to get back to. You follow me? Because I like to be on God's assignments. 
And in the same way, we should be totally aware when we're not expecting the blessing to be with us every day. Do you follow the bridge I'm trying to make? That when you get, see, if I'm somewhere else and Patty's not with me, I wake up, I'm aware she's not with me. I'm aware I woke up and I'm not with my spouse. But we should also, when we get up, be aware I can be with the blessing today. And use our faith for that blessing. And I'm noticing just once I got the revelation. And, and, and I've, known of the, I've known of it the blessing for 25 years. I, I'm not talking about some new thing, but I'm talking about it became rhema to me when I was in Oklahoma. That this thing can really put me over the top. This thing can take me where I can't go by myself. And our church. And the end time church. That it's a it's it's vital we get a hold of this. This is not like, hey, I think I'd like a chocolate a chocolate milkshake today. This is like you need this. Do you follow me? Be like trying to live without protein or trying to live without uh, 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 water. It, it's vital for you for us to go where we want to go. And so we've got to get up every day using our faith intentionally. To access the blessing. And I want you to meditate this. Start meditating every day. The blessings on my life. He has blessed me to be a blessing. He blessed Abraham. Look what he did for Abraham. And I'm a New Testament creation. I'm the righteous of God. Abraham wasn't. The blessing is on my life. And you start meditating what belongs to you out of that. Today I will have divine promotions, divine connections, divine, divine assignments. You follow me? Everything I put my hand to is going to produce. And of course, out of Deuteronomy 28, I have taught on Deuteronomy 28 for 28 years. That's true. I started preaching in 98, or 91. That's been 28 years ago. So after 28 years of teaching Deuteronomy 28 extensively, it finally became rhema to me. It says all these blessings come upon you and overtake you. We're so used to fighting for the blessing. It just kind of passed over my head. They would overtake me. But see, when you get in the flow of faith, healing will overtake you. I don't have to confess. I mean, I confess healing every day, but I don't have to fight sickness every day. Why well, healing's overtaking me. Do you follow what I'm talking about? And the blessing, if we'll get in the flow of using our faith for, will overtake us. And of course, in the glory again, it's automatic. I want to have blessing overtake me. So much I can't contain it. That's what it says for the tither, right? To pour you out a blessing, there will be not enough room to contain it. Not enough room to receive it, right? Your storehouses are overflowing. You just have to give it out because there's too much for you to house. I want that. I want to be an overflowing center of blessing to other people. But you got to use your faith for it. And you start by first getting the revelation, then meditating. I am blessed. We're going to put down a we're going to put together a card for blessing. I'm behind about four or five cards now. Pastor Rebecca texts me, says, You need to put these cards together. And I'm I said, I am. Like I'm finishing his last book, this book I'm on. For verses of the blessing, where it says, You were blessed with faithful Abraham. Amen. The blessing of the Lord should come on you by faith. And you meditate that. I am blessed until it's so much a part of you that you speak it out of a foundation of faith. You have the revelation, you meditated on it, and now you start to apply it. You start to apply yourself to releasing words of faith for the blessing. Every day you get up and say, I'm blessed. I can't lose today. I'm blessed. Nothing can go. You know, we used to confess nothing goes right for me. Did you ever say that? Probably everybody in here said it at one time, right? 
Or for you knew better. Didn't know, didn't know the power of your words. Oh, nothing ever goes right for me. What a stupid thing to say. And when you get a revelation of the, of the blessing, you say, everything always goes right for me. And I say that now. People will say, how are you doing? I said, everything goes perfect for me. I'm blessed. And we have so many people, it's become kind of a catchphrase in the church. Hey, I'm blessed. What's a good confession? Do you know what it means? I'm blessed, but nothing ever goes right for me. You don't have it. <laughs> you really believe you're going to win. You really believe what you're desiring is going to come into manifestation now. And you speak it. And then you act on it. How do you act on the blessing? Any guesses? Well, that's you've been speaking it. I think one of the ways you act on it is you sow. You sow. Hey, Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. Well, if you want to be blessed to be a blessing, you want to overflow, start giving now. Make that shift to become a, a sewing machine, right? A, a professional giver. Somebody looking for needs to give into other people that maybe have a hardship and you want to be the blessing to meet the need in their life. Start with that attitude. Well, you know, you're putting action to it. And then what else? Be looking for it in whatever you do. Expect it. You know, I don't care if you're playing. How can I say bingo with the at the assisted living center, like my mother-in-law does does about every day or two. Expect them to call your number. Expect no matter what you're involved in. Expect when you go out. Expect when you go out into the town, God's going to give you a divine appointment. God's going to give you somebody to speak into the life and probably bring money into your hand. I love the testimony Pastor Jim gives. If you've, if you've never heard him give it, he was in, I don't know if he was in another country or another state. I'm going to tell it because it seemed like, like he was in another country. It was in the lobby of a hotel. And he was talking to God about, the, you know, about prosperity. And, and, uh, I don't remember the whole set of events for the conversation with him and God. But as he's sitting there, a man comes up and throws a hundred dollar bill in his lap. And God says, see, I can bring you money anywhere, anytime. We always want to figure out how it's going to happen. Just expect today money cometh to me. Today, divine connections come to me today. I have I have favor in everything I put my hand to. Sowing and expectation become our actions of faith for the blessing. But also another third part of that is, is step through the open doors. Get rid of fear that would keep you from going through open opportunities and doors. God wants to get you a blessing, but you're afraid to step through it. Here's one. God wants, to, God wants you to bless somebody else, and you're afraid they may reject you. If I offer to pray for them, maybe they'll laugh at me. I'm way beyond that one. How about you? If I see somebody with a need, I'll say, hey, I'll pray for you. I say, okay. And they always think you're going to pray for them in your quiet time at home. And I say, and, and I'm going to lay my hand on your head right now. Where's the pain right now in Jesus? In Jesus' name, where's the pain? <laughs> Just go Pentecostal on them. Full, full blown <laughs> Pentecostal. Hey, you do go out in public, you do a few haws now and then just to get through the fear thing. Because as soon as you offer to pray with them, they already know, they already think you're crazy. You might just lay out the whole thing for them. Hey. Before I pray, I need to do my happy dance. Just shut, just slap that fear up the side of the head. Can you see Charles doing that one? Get through the fear thing. Because if God opens a door for you to minister, for you to bless, 
be willing to go through it. This is part of acting because all this takes faith. You're not just going to flow into all the stuff overtaking you without a battle because devils don't want you in the blessing. Up here, they're going to tell you that's ridiculous teaching. Here, they're going to tell you it can never belong to you. And here, they're going to tell you keep your mouth shut. It's not going to work anyway. You'll embarrass yourself. Listen, the Bible makes it clear. The world's going to think you're foolish. Get over the concern over embarrassing thing. It's going to happen. Amen? But as the blessing of God's overtaking your life, They'll come, they'll come wanting to know, how can I make a fool of myself too? If that's what it produces. Amen. We're fools for Christ, right? So you act on it. And of course, manifestation is everywhere you go, blessing overtakes you. No matter what you do, it works. Divine appointments and connections all day. You pray and things really happen. People bring things to your door. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I love things being brought to your door. You weren't even, you weren't even, nobody knew you even desired. And boom, there it is. Amen. Part of the blessing. Because God knows. And then restoration is so overflowing in your life. You become the supply for everybody else's need. You become the blesser. I want that. See, we always think of, especially ministry, you know, I'm blessed to be a blessing and, and I want to pray and see all these miracles take place. And I do. I want to see everybody healed I pray for. I don't want pain to even be in the same zip code that I'm in. I want to empty out the hospitals. You know, you find there's spiritual principles of this, but you have to be invited. But I want, if I pray for somebody, it happens. But some people need more than your prayer. James said this. He says, what good does it do if your brother be uh, naked or destitute of food? And you say, go and be warm. You pray for him. What good did that do them? You follow me? But he that has two coats, get one. Meet their natural needs. I want to be not just a supernatural healing source a peace source an anointing source i want to be also the source of meeting their natural needs because god so met mine now let me throw this in as well because i'm going to i'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox and this is going to run contrary to many people's christianese thinking but i'll back mine up with scripture there are a lot of people say, yes, the church is there to feed all the poor in the world and meet all their needs. No. We're not. We're not the world's welfare system. Paul said this. He said, meet the needs of people in the church. Do you follow me? And he even said this, however, if a woman be under 60 years old, let her get a job, basically. And save the funds for those that are widows indeed that can't work. And we've got a mindset in the church and even in this nation that the church is there. If somebody doesn't have any money, we're to meet that need. It could be they're just lazy. Do you follow me? Could be they just need help finding a job. We were never meant to be enablers of those who won't. But suppliers of those with a will too. And that's scriptural. Now the Bible says we're to feed the poor. But who are poor indeed. Amen. And they say we're to house, clothe, feed, and everybody that decides they'd rather live off a system. Amen. So when I say I'm blessed to be a blessing, I want to find people with genuine needs that are in a hard time that need a boost. 
not that want to live off boost after boost. And in this nation, we've created a, a, a welfare mentality. Not, not, talking, not talking about any group of people. Any, I'm just talking about we have counties in Kentucky, eastern Kentucky, where 50% of the households are on welfare. And that's not a racial thing. That's not a gender. That's, that's just people have learned to live off of a system. And if they're going to pay you not to work, why bother? Other than self-esteem. But when you take the self-esteem off of the, out of the equation, people don't care. I mean, many people couldn't do that. I don't think I could do that. Based on, I want to work my way. I want to be a value to the community, not a drain. You follow me? So when I'm talking about the blessing, I'm not talking about the church. Okay, we're going to be the supplier for everybody in the world. It's not scriptural. Amen? And listen, I've been involved in feeding the poor. Been involved in soup kitchen. About every kind of outreach you can do. I think we've, I've had a hand at one time or another. And it's amazing how it was expected more than appreciated. People call the soup kitchen, want to know the menu, decide which soup kitchen they were going to that day. But in here, if you've got a hard time, you're going through something, you need to let us know. We're here for you. The best we can, we're going to be here for you. That's what I believe the church is to be about. Jesus said, the poor you have with you always. Amen? So the blessing is not so you can be everybody's enabler and sucker. Amen? It's to you being a supplier of people going through a challenge. Amen? Is that okay with you? Turn to uh, Revelation 22. Oh, I didn't finish this. Hang on, hang on. We're up here, we're acting on it. We're acting on the blessing, right? We're sowing. We're speaking. We're uh, expecting. Then you stand. That's the step I really want to get to this morning. How do you stand for healing? No matter how sick you feel, you keep acting and, acting and speaking. What would make you have to stand for the blessing when it looks like it's not working for you? You know, your car runs out of gas. You want to hear testimony about the blessing of God? I have now run out of gas on my motorcycle six or seven times in the last few years. I, I've just forgotten to check the gauge. And it doesn't have a ding, ding, ding like the car does. And uh, every single time, every single time, even... When I was on the interstate, do you remember the story about on the interstate going to, to Kansas and I ran out on the interstate? And I coasted to the exit, down the ramp on the exit, and the sign said gas two miles. And the bike restarted and I putted two miles and coasted and it, di and it died and I coasted up to the pump. That's happened to me six times in the last few years. You think I get a clue? <laughs> Once with Patty on the back with me. Remember? Ran out in Shelbyville. Died right there. And I go, oh my, I, I forgot to check the gas. <laughs> and usually once you hit it, it'll start again for a little bit. It started, put it, put it around the corner. There's a gas station right there. This is what, this is, this is the blessing. I've got this new bike. And uh, the mileage isn't what I thought it was going to be, I guess. And I'm driving from, I've been to Cynthiana, going through Georgetown. 
I'm about to go to Frankfurt, and I get very to the very edge of Georgetown. Boom, dies. What is going on with this bike? Why did this bike die? I mean, I look, it's out of gas. <laughs> out of gas. And with the very last, well, not the last light. Now they put the one there on the turn to stamping around, I guess. At the bypass light. Runs out of gas. Look, I'm right, there's the station. Right there. I had to start it, starts back up, put around, get gas. And when I fill up, found I still had, I still had a half a tank or so. It was enough to get me halfway home. And I believe had, God had it die right there. Talk about the blessing. I believe God had it die right there next to the station before it was ever out of gas to get me to fill up. You, you know what I'm talking about? It shouldn't have died. Well, like I was popping wheelies and draining the, you know, intake. God's favor. But sometimes it may seem like things aren't going right. Your car runs out of gas, it breaks down. You know, somebody gets upset at you. Maybe at work you get chewed out versus promoted, whatever it could be, and you think, it's not working. That's the stand time. See, things not working in your life in relation to the blessing are the same as symptoms coming on your body in relation to healing. Same as a bill you weren't expecting coming into your life regarding prosperity. See, no matter what you're believing God for, there are always going to be adverse things arise that seem like it hasn't worked. And you think you're going to receive the blessing of God by faith and not have adverse situations? But you stand. And here's, here's one th smart thing to do. Just kind of a side note hit me. When things aren't going right, it's a good time to stop. Just stop right there. Step back and say, step back and say, God, something's not working right. I've missed you somewhere. Or there's something I need to do to blast through this many times. Give me wisdom right for now for right now. And boom, there it will be. I forget what happened the other day. I hit an impasse. Yeah. I had to move this transmission cooler from the old Tahoe to the new Tahoe. And I took all the front lines loose. Everything was loose. And all I had to do was take the lines back off the transmission loose. And I go back there, and it's the lines are way up in there in a crack about that wide between the transmission and the, and, and the frame of the car. There is no way to get my hand up there. I, I'm thinking, should I cut a hole in the floorboard? Well, if I do that, I can't cut a hole in the new floorboard, so I can't get them back on. If I take this off the new one, I'll never get them back on. What am I going to do? And I, and I, I just, I, this, and I spent some time under there. Started to cut pipes out of everything else. And I'm starting to think, I've got to do something. And it occurred, I, I stopped and I said, God, I need wisdom right now. And it dropped in me. They know this problem exists. They're not taking these lines loose. They're splicing lines in. I stopped, got on my, in, on my phone there, I looked up, transmission line splice kit. Boom, there it is. They sell them advanced auto parts. Oh, and if that's what everybody's doing, they're just cutting the lines, splicing them. I didn't even th it didn't occur to me at first. But I hit a spot, looked like the blessing was stopped. And I was going to have a real mess. And listen, had I continued just hard-headedly, I'm going to get this done, I'd have taken the lines loose on the, on because the, I can get them loose, but you can't get the new ones back on. I'd have taken them loose off the new Tahoe and had to drop the transmission probably to get them back on. But stop, prayed, got a solution. And boom, it, I just went and picked up a splice kit. Boom, 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 it was done. And uh, saved me uh, hours and hours of problems. Because you stop and ask God for wisdom. So when you're hitting these impasses, be willing to stop. And say, God, what should I be doing differently? Is there anything I've missed it on you? Is there something I need to back up and take another look at? Many times for me, I understand. I use my examples because they're real to me. I couldn't tell you how many times I've been working on something, stop and pray for wisdom, and God says, you got the wrong tool. 
You got all these tools, go get the right tool for it. Go get something that'll work better. And uh, that's part of standing. Recognize there's going to be opposition. The devil does not want you to access this blessing. He's going to bring up things to try to stop it. Trying to get a loan, something may try to stop it. Amen? Trying to get a promotion, something may try to stop it. Just stand and say, no, I'm the blessed one. How about John Paul's testimony about that house he, bought, he was wanting to buy? Remember that one? And uh, who was it? Randy bought his house? I think his name was Randy bought his house. He was bleeding for a house. About to buy it, and some guy named Randy bought it. And he went and changed the address for Randy and uh, had his own mail sent to the house. And he'd go by the house every day and say, Randy, you got to move to California. You get a job in California. Told the builder, here's the colors I want for the carpet and the paint and everything. And the guy says, this is not your house. He says, Randy's moving to California. He is? Yes, Randy's moving to California. And he, he's, he's up against this thing that looks like it's not working. He's not going to give up. And guess what? Randy got a job offer in California, moved, he got the house. <coughs> now, I'm not telling you to be stupid about this. He must have had a word from God. Do you follow me? <laughs> you got to hear God on these things. I remember years ago, this has been 25 years ago, I was sent to Frankfurt to pastor. We're learning about faith. And if you went out the front doors of the church and looked up on top of Frankfurt, overlooking the church, was this huge mansion. And I believe 50% of the people, mostly the women in the church, claimed that house. That's my house in Jesus' name. And I'm going, you can't all have heard God on that, that that's your house. You guys going to duke it out or take turns? Is it going to be a timeshare? What are you going to do here? I think I knew about timeshares yet. But <laughs> you can't all have the house. You got to hear God. Well, I have heard God. You give me the desires of my heart. That's my house. I thought fights were going to break out over that house. And guess what? No, none of them got it. Amen. They might have had their mail center for a while. I don't know what they were doing. So use wisdom with these things. Revelation 22. I don't know if I went here last week or not. Verse 7, Jesus speaking because it's in the red, right? He says, Behold, I've come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Oh, praise God. Jesus is coming quickly. Now we know this phrase, this, this verse is written for the end times. And God's got a blessing laid up for the end times. The blessing laid up for the end times. To be poured up out, upon, uh, out upon those who know who they are in Christ. Now it's interesting to me, so many prophetic passages of Scripture have laid dormant for thousands of years, but now are being unveiled to the saints. How about the baptism of the Spirit? It was prominent in the first century church. In Corinth, they had a problem. Everybody was given a message in tongues. Right? Everybody had a prophecy, but it went dormant for nearly 2,000 years. Now, there were some through history. I don't believe it's ever been dead. I believe there's always been people carrying along that gift, having encounters, getting baptized in the Spirit. But in Azusa Street in California over 100 years ago, God re-released that upon the world. Amen? And something that lied dormant for those 2,000 years, for most of it, well, probably 1,800, is now flowing through the world. And then revelation of divine healing and divine health. The first century church knew about it. You follow me? They're laying hands on the sick, they're recovering, but it went dormant for about 1,800 years. But now in the past hundred, 
been re-released to the church, even more so now. We have healing evangelists all over the planet. In fact, healing churches all over the planet. People are being healed and raised, delivered. God's, he's opening the channels for the blessings in the end times. Here's one, divine prosperity. Even the first century church didn't have a hold of it, but it was always in the word. But now God's unveiling it to the saints in the end times. How about the blessing? How about the blessing? Abraham had it. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Amen. Jesus. But it went dormant. Probably 1900 years. People knowing really about the blessing. But now. He comes quickly. And those who will line their lives up with the word and believe the word. He's releasing the supernatural blessing of God upon. That will shift. How can I say? The position of the church in the end times. Again, remember Malachi 3. He said to, to the tither. I'm going to make you great, make you a blessing. All nations of the earth shall call you blessed, right? Well, that and through Abraham. And now in the end times, God's about to make his church a blessing. See, when I'm talking about community ambassadors, it's time to come out from behind the four walls of the church. I believe it's time for us to explode out of the four walls of the church. Let me say that again. We're not just going to creep out. We're going to explode out. As we use our faith for this and we get a hold of the blessing, wherever we go, we're going to be released. Just a little. I'm seeing a contact time, you know, contact cold capsule. How many was it? 200 tiny time capsules. Contact capsule. Time release, relief. I believe you're going to go out and you're just going to use your faith and say, God, the blessing's on me. Give me an appointment. You're going to, you're going to go into that area of assignment and God's going to release you to be a spokesman and a light and a source of connection with God. I'm thinking now, back in, back in the late 80s, early 90s, I was with the uh, Fayette County Republican Executive Committee. And I'm meeting Mitch McConnell and Larry Forge, Larry Hopkins, all these people. And uh, they started having me pray over the meetings. I wasn't a pastor yet. In fact, I didn't have my Bible study yet. But I would pray, and they would say, there's something different about your prayers. You pray... With authority, you pray like you believe it. That was really what they were telling me. And uh, what happened? I, I was just a minor guy going, I'm the new guy. But yet you go in and you just step into what God's opened the door to and you start exploding on the scene. And God wants to do that with your life. Amen? Well, Father, we thank you for your word. In this church, there are none sick. None in lack, none oppressed, none in fear. Each one accessing and stepping into willfully and forcefully your supernatural divine blessing. I thank you there's no strife in this church, no division, no hard feelings, no unforgiveness in any area of the members of this, of this church. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you give each one divine appointments, divine encounters. And as they step out, you cause them to explode on the scene and everything they enter into. Thank you, Jesus. You bless them to be a blessing. Blessings overtake their life. That they, they can be poured out into the lives of others and meet needs. Thank you, Jesus. You're coming quickly. Let us be about the Father's work and the Father's focus and not look back. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
thinking about Lot's wife who looked back. Turned into a pillar of salt, right? Don't look back. Go full toward God. Don't look back. Thank you. Pastor Rebecca, anything you want to share?